Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. Hi everyone, this is Multi Hazards, a podcast where we take a deep dive into issues in emergency management, climate change adaptation, security, etc. And ultimately, it's about protection, protecting communities. I'm your host, Vin Nelson. We are back again, back in the saddle. Today is a special day. I'm thrilled to have the chance to interview Dr. Justin Sharp, research scientist and social science coordinator for the Vortex Southeast Project and member of the Behavioral Insights Unit at SIMS in Norman, Oklahoma, USA. SIMS, long name, is the Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies And it is a research organization created in 1978 by a cooperative agreement between the University of Oklahoma and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, Dr. Justin Sharp is currently researching tornado epidemiology, risks, and vulnerability to inform wider research parameters. Now, as we kick off our show today, as is our custom, and out of deep respect for the First Nations, whose land I'm podcasting from, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, I'd like to say a territorial acknowledgement. I'm using the text from our local college in Surrey, Langley, and Richmond called Kwantlen Polytechnic University, or KPU. Here we go. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasin, Kikite, and Kwikwetlem peoples. These are the names of various First Nations groups around me here in Greater Vancouver, here on the west coast of Canada. Now, without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, everybody. This is Vin Nelson with the Multi Hazards Podcast. And today, we are honored to have a special guest with us, Dr. Justin Sharp. And he's here with us all the way from UK while I'm here in Vancouver, BC, Canada. So to start off with, uh, how are you doing, Justin, during this crazy COVID-19 time? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I'm doing OK. I'm, it's it's a little bit strange. Uh, as we were talking about earlier on, I normally work at the National Weather Center in, in Norman, Oklahoma. But uh, uh, my wife recently had a baby and or rather oh, I wow. did with Congratulations. her. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And uh, that was in February. And uh, I came back a, about a week after he was born to be there for two weeks and sort out our visas and all those sorts of things went back to Norman and then within about three or four weeks I was back here because all this happened so it's been an interesting uh, times um, and I think that's the saying is it may, may may you be cursed to live in interesting times right and you're still doing a full uh, workload I believe uh, yes so I'm teleworking so this this means that I'm still maintaining my workload and and the research that I've been working on, on 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 tornado epidemiology, which we can talk about a bit later. But uh, yep, so I've still been doing this, and it's a little bit odd being disconnected. But we meet once a week with the team, and I meet my boss once a fortnight. I, you know, we sort of have a one to one about progress and things that we're doing. So you know, it's still we still manage to be productive. Okay, that that's that's awesome. I know strange times we're living in. So. To uh, launch into this, I'd like to ask you, how did you get into um, disaster risk reduction as an academic? And I guess we have to back up a little bit and say, what is uh, disaster risk reduction? Uh, yeah, OK, so I suppose that's quite a, quite a good um, question, really. So we have disaster risks. Um, first thing I would say is that disasters are not natural. So calling them natural disasters is being seen more and more as a as, as a as a bit of a no-no really because um disasters are they may have roots in natural hazards 
but it's when they meet with human beings and what human beings do and don't do that creates the situation of the disaster. Disaster risk reduction is aimed at many different ways of trying to reduce the impact of the disaster, become resilient to the disaster and bounce forward again from that disaster. And I say bounce forward and not bounce back because actually bouncing forward is useful. Bouncing back means you return to the same position you were when the disaster struck with the same structural and uh, and societal weaknesses, which means that if that same sort of hazard was to impact again, you'd have another disaster. Um, okay. So I hope that answers mm. that. Um, right. In terms of like starting as an academic, um, my story is a little bit interesting. I, I didn't start as an academic. I was a school teacher in 2004 in the United Kingdom in London. And I had bought that summer in 2004 a seismograph from uh, this website and from these people who ran um, and, and sold seismographs out in California. I brought that into the school. It was very exciting when I went back in there in September. Over the Christmas time, there was the Boxing Day uh, earthquake 9.5 and then the tsunami that came with that. That mm-hmm. seismograph had picked it up. I was one of only two uh, sort of um, seismographs in school in the whole United Kingdom. So I started writing about this. I started doing outreach with schools and primary schools to help them understand what the hazard was and how we might prevent that. And then from that, the UN wanted to use me as an example of good practice because I'd produced a website called Edu for geo uh, edu for hazards, uh, dot org and and then it sort of started from there and I realized there was a whole academic world and as my first degree was in environmental studies and I'd been teaching geography I had a, a fairly solid grounding and then I started to do my PhD. Wow that's wonderful yeah I saw your your website yesterday and it, it's it's fascinating I think you, there was even a connection in uh, what was it Laos did you did you actually go there or I did. I did go to Laos. I was uh, I worked for Save the Children as a consultant and uh, produced a primary school curricula uh, for disaster risk reduction. Um, I found out um, like about a year or two ago that that curricula is now going to be used in North Korea, um, wow. which was the most strange segue into it because it wasn't designed specifically for necessarily a Southeast Asian market but it because it was produced in Laos which is the People's Democratic Republic of Laos which means that that is a, a communist country and so in a way they were happy then to take on education materials that came from another communist country that also understood the context. What was useful about me going there is I, I, I saw the reality of the classrooms, I saw the reality of the resources that they did have and what they didn't have, I saw the reality of the hard-working teachers there and I recognised that having been a teacher myself. And that meant that I could create resources very much tailored for that environment and tailored for lower literacy levels, tailored for, um, you know, allowing children to explore and have fun while learning. Well, that's wonderful. And it appeared to me from reading up online about all the work you've been doing, you've been in this game for many, many years. So what's kept you in it for so long? Um. We still have disasters. I think that's key. I think a driving force is that you want to minimise the impact of the disasters. And like I said, enable societies to become far more resilient, adaptable and able to bounce forward. Um, and there are multiple different ways of doing that. And so there are multiple different ways that has kept me interested over this period of time. I think initially it started with education, but over time and certainly through my thesis, it became more about learning. So I'm interested in that space where adults also learn, because adults are often the ones that make the household decisions. Adults are the ones that that are supposed to be responsible for the households. So perhaps we need to be targeting them as well as children and understanding what they can and can't do. So you consider yourself a scientist? Um, My job is a research scientist, so I am a scientist, um, but I am a social scientist, so I have... A background in physical science and um, a- and social science. So my undergraduate degree was a Bachelor of Science. My PhD was in the School of uh, Geography at King's College London. And within that, it was far more social science based and policy based. So it's interesting that I'm able to 
look at this with a wider strategic perspective that takes the science and then actually tries to find ways to make that palatable and usable to the public at large. Right. That's fascinating. So I was also looking up about Vortex hyphen SE, I guess that's Southeast. And uh, I didn't know what it was, but I started looking into it. I was like, wow, it it reminded me of this 90s movie called Twister that I had seen. (laughs) And I was just I was looking at some of the photos online. It was like all these this big storm truck of storm chasers. So it was fascinating. Well, I can see that from going from a walk from my office. So um, uh, you need to look up online and and perhaps your listeners do as well. If you type in on YouTube, the National Weather Centre Norman, uh, there's a three minute video there that takes you around literally where I work. And we have the props from the movie Twister. Not only do we have the props, um, I work with someone called uh, uh, Dr. Harold Brooks, who's been in this field a lot longer than I have. A very, very clever uh, man and he was the scientific advisor for that movie so uh, we have some we have some really interesting conversations about that and and the the uh, original NOAA experiment that that um that uh helped them think about some of these concepts and ideas in the movie it is is actually also there in the national weather center so it's a very good place to work there's uh, about 550 um scientists that work in the building um, a school of meteorology uh, uh oklahoma university is taught there as well so there's a really nice kind of buzzing atmosphere of scientists and students um based within it is the national severe storms laboratory i, I work as a research scientist I'm, I'm one of a very few uh, social scientists there's a handful of us who work in the behavioral insights unit who are social scientists economists um social psychology geographers like myself and we're dealing with um, the social science aspect of um, the tornado um, um, risk, resilience and vulnerabilities, really. Wow. I that's it's a big deal in the in the U.S. There's uh, I heard there's Tornado Alley. And then I think you're involved in something that's called Dixie Alley there in the southeast of the U.S. And they're they're quite different storms. Um, the different storms, um, different intensities come at different times of year. Um, and I, th- I think the other thing about them is that they have different populations there. Um, the, the traditional, if we want to go through kind of uh, popular culture, before Twister, there was the Wizard of Oz and it's Kansas. And there's fields and fields and fields for miles. And of course, there are tornadoes that go through there. And unfortunately, um, these cause loss of life. Um, But what we tend to have is uh, large populations in the southeast uh, United States, often vulnerable, often living in mobile manufactured housing, which makes them somewhere between uh, 15 to 30 times on based on different studies, more likely to become a fatality in a tornado. So it, it makes it very, very interesting to study in terms of the physical science in places like Alabama, the physical landscape of lots of hills and forest make it hard for radar to penetrate and therefore for warnings to be given as well. And on top of that, we also have a prevalence of nocturnal tornadoes, which adds a new layer of complexity and a new layer. So of, nighttime. Uh, yeah, nighttime, nighttime tornadoes, basically. Um, wow. The problem Scary. with that is partially people being in, uh, in vulnerable housing, but also partially the fact that either they don't have their phone on or they're not looking at the weather on the TV because they've gone to bed. So they're not getting the warnings in time. So this is something we're also going to be trying to look at as well. Um, And I would say that, you know, having a NOAA weather radio is a real lifesaver here. um, For if you're within that region in the Southeast United States or just in the United States generally. So do they have those, uh, you know, what do they call the public sirens that are like on a big pole and they just you can hear it for miles around so well i mean and and, but that's interesting you say that you you sort of can and you can't hear it for miles around um and actually they're only effective if you're outside you can't always hear them inside if you're sat just playing on your xbox inside say for instance you might not even hear them um so that's an interesting thing um they're tested every saturday at 12 o'clock in norman uh, unless there's a an ou football game on and um 
you can hear them sometimes you can definitely hear them if you're outside but if you're inside there's a thing uh, now the problem with that is if you're in rural areas where a lot of people live and a lot of people live in mobile manufactured housing in rural areas there aren't the sirens so they're not even getting those alerts so there's a whole again there's lots and lots of complexity in a lot of the research that i've been looking at recently which has been uh, examining tornado epidemiology through a, a, a meta ethnographic analysis wow that's uh, that's very fascinating now are are these um this tornado alley for example is it moving north because i heard that because of climate change and and all for example i live in vancouver and they say maybe in a few years we're going to have a san francisco climate so is it true that these uh, tornado alleys are are slowly creeping north i can't tell you with scientific uh, certainty that that is the case and i haven't got at my fingertips right now any evidence that suggests that now that doesn't mean that won't happen it just means that i can't tell you right now oh yes there's definite mm-hmm. evidence of that because that's not the case so i think we're very careful with those sorts of uh statements and we're very careful with thinking about those things um because um there's no evidence right now that doesn't mean we might not find evidence in the future but right now that's not the case it seems logical, doesn't it, to make that leap? Because, of course, there are areas that are warming. Uh, there's no denying that. And certainly California has experienced severe warm- warning and severe drought and severe uh, fire hazard. Um, and perhaps that might be creeping northwards as well. I know that North, uh, northern California is experiencing uh, more wildfire uh, uh, breaks. That may be. Um, contributed via uh, climate change but again you see as a scientist you have to be sort of cautious with these things and this isn't denialism by the way it's it's caution and I think that's really important Mm -hmm. as a scientist to actually only be able to qualify it with evidence if that makes sense okay Uh, is there any connection whatsoever though with climate change uh, right now in in that part of the U.S. with tornadoes and other storms I, I personally don't know. So I can't actually say with certainty about that uh, because I'm not a I'm not a modeler. I haven't got the statistical kind of data in front of me. And actually, from what I do understand about tornadoes and the physical production of tornadoes, we're talking about this on a sort of a really large sort of vertical scale through the atmosphere. And there's lots of different uh, climatic variations and temperature and pressure variations through that that drive tornadoes but we only see or rather it's only impacted in the column of air that is twisting on the ground and so people think of it in that very very small scale and it's far more complex than that and actually where i work is the cooperative institute for mesoscale meteorological uh, uh, studies so mesoscale is sort of somewhere in the middle so it's not necessarily on a macro scale it's not on a micro scale it's a mesoscale so relatively local in terms of few hundred miles because of course a lot of tornadoes come out of large supercells and great big thunderstorms and on the edges and in between these sorts of things there's lots of complexity there and there's people who are uh, far more uh, have far more expertise in these particular storms that would be able to talk about whether or not um, these are linked to climate change but right now I, I i wouldn't be able to say definitively at all whether that was the case does that is that you know is that fair yeah, yes, yeah, that's for sure. I because I heard, for example, some news stories were talking about in um, the Car- Caribbean, the Caribbean, that uh, mm-hmm. some of the hurricanes may be intensified through climate change. But these things are always on it. in ongoing but, studies, yeah. right? But they are. But also, hurricanes and tornadoes are very, very different. Um, so, mm-hmm. uh, what drives a, a, a tornado and what drives a hurricane okay so we've got uh, large warm air masses meeting cooler air masses is what you know partially is generating that sort of uh, tornadoes what happens with hurricanes is with hurricanes you've got to have i think ocean temperatures of i think it's 26.5 degrees centigrade that's the ocean temperatures and, and then you have tropical storms that kind of go over those from the west coast of Africa and then slowly they build over time and there's rotation as they cross over the kind of the equator and you have the the spinning or the rotation of those storms. The more incoming uh, 
insulation and so incoming solar radiation that that goes into the oceans and warms the oceans what that does is not so much about the frequency of hurricanes but it might add to the intensity of the hurricanes the amount of moisture in hurricanes and the storm surge that causes the devastating flooding in hurricanes so these are slightly different as you can imagine from tornadoes which are like i said much more on that meso scale Right. And are these tornadoes in the southeast of the U.S., is it seasonal? Like, are there certain months where they hit uh, more often? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, and traditionally, there was a, a season thought about in terms of, uh, like you were talking about, the, the Midwest. But actually, tornadoes can happen at any time of the year. Genuinely, they can. If there's the right convective conditions they can happen any time of year and actually some of the the larger tragedies we've had and some of the fatalities we've had is because people weren't turning on radios and news because they were assuming that um there wasn't uh going to be a tornado tornadoes have happened between november and march you get a lot of nocturnal tornadoes occurring during that time and one of the reasons they're occurring that time and people are sort of affected by it is people are going home it gets dark earlier and they can't see the nocturnal tornadoes. So a lot of people want to visually identify a tornado and see where it is and look for a wedge or look for a spinning vortex of air and go, oh, that's a tornado. You can't necessarily see that at night. So again, we've got even more complexity here as well. So yeah, it, it's there isn't a, I'd say that it can happen at any time. Um, this has been known for a long period of time. This isn't new for me, um, but um, that's something that uh, I think that we perhaps need to really communicate better with our publics is that they can happen at any time. And perhaps you need to have the right uh, plan ready, the right equipment ready and, you know, know where your safe space and where your shelter in place is. Right. Well, uh, just a thought off the top of my head, maybe there, there's some military glasses can be issued to the population. They can see it. Now, I don't know if you can see a tornado at night with military glass, but it, it sounds like very complicated. All right. Moving on here. Now, we're in the, the middle of COVID-19 and I don't know how much about pandemics you may have studied in the past, but do you think there are any lessons that could be applied from all this uh governmental and public uh, response to COVID-19 and, and perhaps p apply it to disaster risk reduction or, or tornadoes or anything like that? Um, I think communication of the message, um, like I said, uh, Australia and New Zealand got a handle on what to do very quickly, communicated it very, very clearly with their publics. Um, New Zealand, for instance, had a one to four alert level, which s tells the public this is the alert level. This is why we're at this alert level. And this is what we expect you to do. And this is what we will be doing during this time. They also back that up with actually producing the contact tracing and communication of that. And I think that's really key. So very clear communication, very early and giving people enough information and not being secretive about the reasons for things and just saying science tells us without explaining to people what that science is telling us. Right. I watched a uh, video, I think it was about the Vortex uh, Southeast, and it was on a CNN article. And it appeared that one of the keys, you just mentioned it, is, is communication to the public. And I know that it's it's really tough to take science and all that high level vocabulary and just get it to people's level where everyday people can just get it. They can grasp it. They say, oh, I'm in danger. I need to do A, B and C. So I, I know that that's that's your specialty. Uh, part of your specialty, right, is uh, public communication. Um, I think part of it, yeah. So my, my job at Vortex Southeast is I am the social science coordinator for the Vortex Southeast project. And what that means is I liaise with and communicate and learn from lots of different um, uh, principal investigators on lots of different projects across the Vortex Southeast region, which is in the Southeast United States. And one of that or part of that is communication. Part of that is is learning and I'm really keen for people to learn for themselves 
So we need to provide the right opportunities for those people to learn. And in in their environment, in their communities, in their um, faith groups, in their churches, in their communities, rather than sort of coming through a, a top down, um, just here's some information now um, do what we say, because I think people don't necessarily um, cope well with that or they may not trust that information. If they learnt it for themselves, if they built self-efficacy because there is belief in their ability to do something and make a positive change in their lives that is going to potentially save their lives, that will stay with them much longer and they're more likely to maintain that behaviour. Right. I, I heard that, say, after a disaster, there's this window of opportunity to communicate with the public and everybody's kind of on pins and needles. They're interested. They're hungry for information. And then as time goes on and it, it kind of people forget about it and it may be harder to communicate with the public because there's no disaster in recent memory. So how do you think we sure. can motivate motivate people? Well, there's, a, there's an interesting thing you can illustrate this with here. There's, there's something in uh, psychology called the concept of unique invulnerability. And the idea is this is actually we don't really want to think about our demise and ex existential risks and disasters to many people are existential risks. And so it, it's more about how do we make them more palatable and enabling of people to make positive changes and be prepared for and know how to respond. Now, there's a bit of a caveat there. If people don't have the right access to resources, if they don't have well-developed social networks, then it doesn't matter. We can provide these opportunities, but unless they have these opportunities and are able to take them, then we're not really going to make an impact and inroads into this. So what I've been trying to um, communicate with my colleagues and how we're moving forward now is to create research that is less extractive, um, which basically means that what may occur, and I'm not talking about my project now, but just generally in the field is what people do is they go into communities, they talk with the communities, communities feel that there's going to be change, there's going to be action, there's going to be something that makes them uh, kind of safer. And then that doesn't happen and it erodes their trust. And that's something I want us to avoid. So now what we're trying to do is, is come up with going into communities with trusted um, scientists, with trusted workers in those communities and try and learn from them what they need. We can go through the top down route, but it doesn't seem to be working. So perhaps what we need is a little bit of top down and a little bit of bottom up approaches so we can meet in the middle, work out exactly what needs to be changed and then enable these communities to act upon it. Right. So at community level, maybe, for example, they know the best means of communication. Um, I was just thinking about that. For example, there are some communities like where I live in Canada where there is no Wi-Fi. So you know, everything right. gets dumped online. We're going to do it through online. But a lot of places they have either spotty Wi-Fi or mm. no Wi-Fi. So it's so, as you were saying, it may be a problem in many of these communities. That's an I mean, that's an excellent uh, um point and it's something that I actually found through my PhD research so my PhD research looked at community emergency response teams and then LISTOS which was a Spanish language family aware and prepare program uh, which also then developed into Spanish um, uh, community emergency response training as well and one of the things that came up time and time again was trust was built by emergency managers connecting with them and being present within their communities and that means being there it means continuing on and training and bringing them back for more training and engaging with them and building a wider communities of practice and I think I learned from that 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 is a really exceptional way to do things it's often not done because it's not seen as a cheap option it's often not done because it's not seen as something that can be covered by a mass leafleting campaign or a mass communication tool like something for a Facebook feed or or through Twitter. And um, not everybody looks at Facebook. Not everyone has Twitter. Not everyone's interested in that. So how are we engaging with those communities? We need to be in and among those communities and talk with them rather than at them. 
Right, right. And just uh, backing up, you were you mentioned emergency managers. So I was just um, wondering, is what's the connection between disaster risk reduction? I know that's a especially in Europe, that's a big buzzword. But in North America, we use the word emergency and the old word is disaster management. So uh, they're one and the same, aren't they? Um, so I think really emergency management really grew after the Second World War, certainly in the United States, but also in Europe as well. So what we had was we had a lot of demobilizing uh, military. So people who had volunteered and had, had fought in Second World War, uh, but maybe were still employed by the army. And we one of the things that we, we started to develop was kind of a civil contingency. How can we use these people to 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 actually engage in what eventually became emergency management. Now, emergency managers are people who are um, not always, but largely professionally trained in emergency management, who then communicate with local police, with local fire, with local em- other emergency services, as well as with local policy to try and protect whatever community they're in. That might be at county level, that might be at state level. And it can also be at national level as well. Um, So I think that that's what it's sort of engaged into. And of course, in the United States, federally, you have the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA. Mm -hmm. So we have this here. You mentioned slight difference in Europe. I I, I think that Europe is uh, certainly a little bit more United Nations centric. And so what's happened over time is disaster risk reduction has become something that has uh, become more more important. But that has been based on the research that looks at disasters as as through a lens of risk, vulnerability, um, the hazard itself and its magnitude and the capacity of, of individuals to adapt, respond and prepare for it. Right. And isn't there a whole entire related field called climate change adaptation and a lot of the research a lot of the uh, webinars the conferences some of the information is very much the same yes and this is for a very specific kind of uh, I, I think a, a united nations thing as much as anything else so the principal organization that deals with disasters is the united nations disaster risk reduction uh, sort of secretariat which is based in geneva um, it used to be called unisdr um, and what's happened is over time is uh, firstly, after the um, sort of tsunamis we had in 2004 and then the hurricanes in 2005, uh, what um, ended up becoming a piece of sort of policy within the UN or a framework really was the Hyogo framework for action. This was a disaster risk reduction framework which tried to understand disasters, tried to understand how we were going to reduce the impact of disasters and how we would become more resilient. That ran from 2005 to 2015. And then now we're halfway through something called the Sendai framework for for action. And again, this is built on this. As climate change and climate change adaptation has become more of an interest, both in policy, but in the research space, a lot of the language used crosses over a lot of the idea of looking at this from a social ecological systems theory view has you know been in both fields in both spheres and I've written about this when I've looked at transformative learning in these spaces is actually linking disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation because there's lessons to be learned from both in terms of policy that is within the targets that are there within the Sendai framework for Earth. Uh, for for action. Um, And I worked with um, as a consultant for UN for the European office, uh, working precisely on this and actually looking at what uh, governments had done and trying to evaluate said they'd done versus what had actually been achieved, which was a very interesting uh, learning process. Right. And it seems that climate change is becoming more uh, a thing with the public and we've seen a lot of extreme weather events where do you think climate change is is, is heading right now I, I don't know if that's a kind of a, a funny question but like wh- where is it where's it heading now we, like we had all the wildfires in Australia and before that it was like Siberia and uh, the north is heating up like where do you think things are headed um, right now like 2020 
Well, it's very interesting. I think that COVID-19 has brought uh, our frailty into and actually climate change is something that is going to affect almost everybody on the planet. Um, And so we need these frameworks, but we also need policies that to come from national governments that take it seriously. Um, And to some extent that's happening and to another extent it's not. Um, So (laughs) it's interesting. I don't want to be overly pessimistic. I'm an optimist by nature. I I think that actually doing this work, you, you need to be an optimist by nature. You always need to be looking for new solutions, new forms of adaptations, new forms of policy that can actually drive things forward. I think the other thing that uh, COVID-19 has done is actually made people think slightly differently about the economy and how we're generating wealth within that economy, but also how there is an opportunity to actually go forward with uh, green plans, which have green funds and greener energy policies and uh, greener, cleaner cars and all of these things that have been uh, talked about um, globally for a while now but dismissed because we've been carrying on as normal. Right. I heard even some cities are planning to just not reopen streets to cars. They're going to keep them for bicycles. Um, Yeah. And I think that makes sense potentially from from an epidemiological standpoint, as well as from a a pollution standpoint. So uh, it's interesting. We talked about climate change. We talked about disaster risk reduction. Uh, One of the biggest killers actually globally right now is air pollution. Um, and this is there is no part of the planet almost that is not suffering with air pollution. And, you know, I, I, it's very early to, to tell what the impact of air pollution has been on, you know, bringing about some of the underlying health conditions that has made pe- some people more vulnerable to to you know this this particular pandemic and like i said i'm not making that connection i'm saying that i wonder if that's something that is discovered later on it's not something i i know for uh, by with any certainty right so right. i think i think these are interesting questions are there interesting things that will occur over time but while we're dealing with uh, you know the pandemic now we we you know we i think we need to be quite nimble um maybe not have such uh uh, large top-down governmental views of things and in fact um, cities across the world have been implementing their own climate change policies mayors across the world have been doing that and also mayors across the world have been tackling air pollution in a similar way so I think there's hope actually from from the smaller scale rather than from the larger scale which I think is um, is is very interesting and I think that's what makes working in the United States so very interesting is that you know it is the United States of America but each one of those states almost feels like a separate country with their own policies their own ideals and their own responses so I think that makes that um, a challenge but also an opportunity for some really nimble thinking and some hopefully creative solutions going forward. Wow that sounds wonderful now just kind of looking at the big picture here, what would you say your role or your theme or your life ideal, your vision is at, at this point? For what, disaster risk reduction or? Just just, or, uh, just for your career. And it, um, it sounds like for sure this is your passion. Yeah, this is something I've held, held a passion for, for for a number of times. So, you know, when I introduce myself, you know, I'm a geographer. I mean, that's that's basically what it is. Geographers is, you know, uh, studies the earth, its peoples, its environments. And that is still a driving passion for me. Um, But living on an active earth requires ways of being able to respond to that. Um, Like I said, I've evolved my thinking over time. Um, I, I really would have said, and because I started out as an educator, that education was, you know, that's that's the way to do it. We'll get through to the families by getting through to the kids and to a certain extent, that does exist. And there's some research that holds that up. And um, I think Laurie Peake has done some work on this and others have done some work in this field as well. Um, but like I said, that's evolved over time to actually look at the wider learning and learning in adults as well. And that's not just about behavioural change or nudging people. It's not just about trying to push people in one direction and hopefully that they follow. It's about allowing people to learn for themselves. Like I said, when people learn for themselves, 
they feel that they've discovered that for themselves and it becomes a far more important psychological driver of being able to respond to risk because they feel that they can do something about it so i'm intrigued and excited to be able to now work with these communities going forward i mean you know hopefully as you know hopefully we'll get a handle on the pandemic and, and as time goes forward i'm looking forward to going out into those communities and learning from them um i've learned so much in an academic sense but what I really love is learning from people, hearing their stories, hearing their ideas and seeing how we can make that become a reality to enable a far safer world. Well, hopefully as this pandemic kind of peters out that you'll you'll get your chance. And I, I certainly hope so. I, I, I think I was supposed to be going out to um, sort of um, tornado chasing, but in, a, in, in quite a scientific way um, uh, um, this, this spring. And I was really looking forward to it. And. It kind of didn't happen. And, and uh, people from Norman keep showing on, on Facebook like these wonderful pictures of Mamata's clouds and a storm just passed through there. And someone said, oh, wow, we just had a supercell pass through here. And I'm like, these are things that I came to America to see. But at the moment, I'm kind of stuck back in, in, in London, you know, waiting to, to get back into that office and get back into those communities. So it's definitely something I'm looking forward to. And as a geographer, you know, I like to travel. I like to see the world and different people's cultures languages and and uh see what they they can tell us and teach us right are you going to be able to get into that twister truck <laughs> um yeah i mean that's 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 the that that'd be the thing at some point in the future that would be, be something because it's important really to understand what happens you know after they go through an area and i think some of the devastation as well and and to really sometimes you do need to see these sorts of things um it's not about sort of uh, a ghoulish fascination with things um, i'm certainly fascinated with the nature of the storms and i'm fascinated with the physical processes that that drive them uh, but like i said i work with far cleverer and 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 far more uh you know uh, professional and trained meteorologists who know this stuff inside out so i love learning from them as well and asking them questions because you know they they like to you know they like to share that information with me and i think that's brilliant right and at the end of the day it's all about protecting communities very much so that's 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 you know and, and this is why i keep saying that in order to protect communities we need to learn from them what their needs are um yes we've got the science that has shown us so far about how we can track tornadoes how we can actually use radar to see where they are how we can predict to a certain extent where they might uh, where they might be we can now issue watches and we can now issue warnings i say now it's been a feature for quite a long time um but but we need where's the next mile where's the next really big thing we think that the really next big uh, progress is going to be made in the social sciences and the social and behavioral sciences in finding out what people need and then enabling them to go forward and do that. We want them to be able to take their protective actions. Um, you know, if you live in a, a mobile manufactured housing, what are the uh, what are the best things that you can do? What are the cheapest things that you can do? What are the free things that you can do? Th those sorts of questions are the things that we we need to be learning more about. And we need to also underline and underscore the fact that tornadoes are survivable. Um, this is something that we've looked at the epidemiology. We've, but in a way, you know, we're trying to learn the tales of the dead, which is very difficult to do. We need to learn the tales of the living, too, to understand what they did right and whether we can make sure that this is replicated and shared and learned with others. Now, that sounds wonderful. Justin, I'm just wondering if you met a 20 year old, say who's looking into getting into a career, something like what you're doing, or even a middle-aged person looking to switch their career into mm -hmm. something like what you're doing, uh, directly, indirectly protecting communities. What, what kind of advice would you give to them? Um, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I, I think that you said that I speak passionately about this. I speak passionately about this because it is my passion. So I think it's really got to be a passion with that person. And, and from emergency managers I've talked to, it really is their passion. Their passion is that public safety. Um, and they have lots of ideas of doing this. And they're very 
good at communicating these things. So I think that's really important. I think certainly having a really good solid grounding in geography, that, that, that solid grounding in geography gives you a really good understanding of meteorology, uh, gives you an understanding of seismology to a certain extent. And perhaps you might want to uh, go down that physical sciences route, you know, working more towards uh, seismology and the work that the United States Geological Survey does, for instance. Or you might actually be leaning more towards meteorology and end up working with me at the National Weather Centre as a, as a meteorologist or a broadcast meteorologist. But you also need to um, realise that there are lots of different approaches to this. There is not one career and one career path that you can choose. There are many career paths that you can choose. And I've developed this by working hard at this over many, many years um, since, like I said, at least since 2004, which is 16 years when I think about it, which terrifies me a little bit. Um, <laughs> so it, it's being able to have a bit of staying power as well. Um, and I've been lucky enough to work with some wonderful, clever people in UN organisations, in non-governmental organisations, in universities and now uh, other research scientists at uh, the National Weather Centre in Norman. All right. Is there anything you, else you'd like to tell our audience out there? Um, well, actually, one thing we've we not talked about is I run a website called uh, Education for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is uh, edu4drr.org. And I set this up. This has been running for about 10 years now. And some of the things on there, which we talked about before, which is curriculum based, uh, based such as the, the work that I did. It has video resources. It has um curricular resources that i developed yeah i looked at your website last night yeah, too yeah. and it, it is it's it's fabulous it has all kinds of um what curriculum and maybe lesson plans yeah. and then the comic yeah. strips those uh what's it called timmy there's this little Silly character timmy. named timmy oh it's exactly. wonderful yeah it's, so th- th- what's what's good about that is it's also available in lots of different languages now so it's available ah. fully i think in french Spanish, German, um, some are in Portuguese. I've got some people putting it into different Malay languages as well. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I've been most proud of has been producing that. And actually, that was then also turned into a book by UNESCO in Pakistan. And actually, there's a physical copy of my Silly Timmy comics that actually went out into into rural areas in Pakistan. So that's the one thing that, you know, that I've really been I think proud of and has been a really useful communication tool um, because it's not just for t- uh, for children. It can be people with lower levels of literacy as well. And I think that's really important not to overlook those members of our societies globally. Um, and I think that's probably where I stand. I look at things globally at the moment. I'm looking at maybe more at that Mesa scale and maybe more at, you know, the southeast United States um, to learn what you know what really happens and what we can do to improve the situation then it sounds like you're moving in an in an inspiring career it's it's kind of like indiana jones on the move right 2020 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah yeah well i want to yeah. thank you so much for coming into this interview and it's it's been a pleasure i hope our listeners have learned a lot from you i'm also planning to uh go through this um this podcast and and make a study guide uh one or two pages out of this so that perhaps um universities or high schools could use it in the future and uh, i just want to thank you again justin for for coming in and and i really hope you enjoy your weekend thank you very much uh, vin it's been an absolute pleasure and uh good luck with the rest of the series as well i look forward to listening to it all right thank you so much take care you too Bye bye That's the interview. Dr. Justin Sharp is doing very important work. And I, for one, learned a lot from him during this interview. I want to thank him again for being an interviewee here at the Multi-Hazards Podcast. Right here, I'd like to insert a little disclaimer that I should be putting into each and every one of my podcasts. And that is, this podcast is meant to be educational and does not try to offer legal, medical, or other specific advice unless otherwise noted. Also, the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations that the host, that's me, or guests are part of. 
So, here at the conclusion of this episode, I'd like to thank all of you, each one of you, for listening. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more. This is Vin Nelson wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all. Peace out. <laughs>